and more in a sacrificial way. More to say that everything that Jesus did here on earth, he knew he was going to die anyway. He knew he was headed to the cross anyway. And yet he decided to do what he did, to live the way he lived, to act the way he acted out of his deep love for you and I. When we begin to read the Gospels that way, it changes the way that we see Jesus and the way that we see ourselves. So, last week we talked about Jesus' baptism. We talked about the idea that before Jesus began anything in his ministry, before he began preaching, teaching, healing, any of that stuff, he wanted to be baptized because he wanted to be identified by the Father for who he is, as someone loved, called, and chosen. And so, Jesus comes off this baptism experience, it's very high, very cool, the Lord speaks, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, it's a whole thing. It goes really well. And from there, he heads directly into the wilderness. Now, this would not have been my travel plan. This would not have been my agenda. I don't usually go from these wonderful high spiritual experiences and go, you know what? Let's go into the wilderness. Let's not eat anything for 40 days. Let's be tempted by the devil. That sounds like a good next step for me. No, I don't want to do, I don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. I'm the person who comes home from vacation and wants more vacation. <laughs> I'm not coming out of there going, you know what? Time for something tough. But that's what Jesus did. And the importance of this is that for you and I, as we call ourselves followers of Jesus, and we strive to be like Jesus, it's important for us to know that he went through everything we go through. And so Jesus, in this moment, has to experience this deep and profound temptation so that you and I, as believers, can say, okay, Jesus was there. Jesus did this. Jesus can relate to my life, to my struggle, to what's going on here. And it's important for us to be able to say that. Because we need, we need a Savior who knows. We need a God who knows us, who knows our struggles, and who loves us in the middle of that. So let's dive into this this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. It says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Duh. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put, your Lord the, you, put, do not put, do not put the Lord your God to the test. These are the times I'm so frustrated that we're on YouTube. Because I think, can we just edit that out whenever I sound stupid or trip over my words? Anyhow, Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. So, what we have here, first of all, what I, what I want to point out is here in 4.1 it says this, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And this is where I want to start this morning. Too often, you and I as believers, we think to ourselves, we think, oh no, I'm going through a struggle. I'm being tempted. People are coming against me. I'm in a difficult situation. Oh no, the devil must be winning. Man, it was, it was a nail biter there between God and the devil, and the devil has taken the lead. Oh no, I'm being tempted. Somebody's coming against me. People are saying nasty things about me. Stuff is not going right. I'm struggling. The devil is winning. That's just not the way it is. In fact, often, when we go through difficult things, it's because the Spirit is leading us to and then through something. You know, I always point this out. It's the same reason I hate going to the gym. I just, I just don't like it. Listen, it's not because I don't think the gym would work for me. I think if I went and started lifting weights and started running on the treadmill and doing those things, I think I'd be a more fit person. I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth it to go to the gym and go through all this fitness. I came up, I have an app on my phone called Time Hop. 
And so all, the, all of my tweets and, and, and Facebook posts and, and pictures from this day in history will come up. And today I was talking with my, uh, my grandma, the infamous Nana. And she was talking, apparently we were watching something on TV, there was some fitness, and she said, do you really, do you really think it, it'd be worth it to go through all that pain and struggle to have a great physique? And then she looked at me and go, well, obviously you don't. <laughs> I said, accurate, I, 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 don't. I don't, I don't think it's worth it. Because the truth of the matter is, is... I don't, I don't really think it's worth all that struggle and the dieting and the exercising to have, a, to have any kind of great physique. I'll stick with this physique. It's all right. It's like a 5 out of 10 physique, but I'll take it. But the truth of the matter is, is God is frequently leading us to difficult things so he can lead us through difficult things so we can be made more holy on the other side of it. And so too often we have this idea that bad things are from the devil. Well, the truth of the matter is, is these struggles that we go through, these challenges that we often walk through, is God saying, I am ready to take you deeper. I'm ready to take you to the next level. I'm ready to grow your faith. I'm ready to grow what God is doing in your life. This is not always fun. In fact, it's frequently not fun. It's frequently challenging and difficult and a struggle. And yet, we know that on the other side of it, we'll be more like Christ. Hallelujah. And so we go. Some of us, like me, kicking and screaming and grumbling the whole way. But we go. And the next thing Jesus does is he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. And so he's hungry, Scripture says. And this is also important because we need to know that often... When we experience these temptations and, and challenges and struggles, it's when we're at our weakest. It's, it's, not, it's not always, you know, in the middle of some great thing, or it's not always, you know, when we're sitting in church on a Sunday morning listening to a sermon or engaging in worship or hearing these beautiful songs. You know, it's, it's when we're at our weakest, when we're hungry, when we're struggling, when we're hangry, actually. Are you guys familiar with hangry? It's people who get angry when they haven't eaten. This is, this is, I, I am this way. And so... After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is hungry, and, and the devil comes in and says, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so the first thing that, that the Satan tries to attack Jesus on is, is at his point of weakness. Jesus is hungry. It's a physical weakness. And so the devil comes to him with a physical temptation. This is a basic thing that we all encounter, right, all the time, is that we all have physical temptations. They're temptations for things that we know we ought not do, we know we ought not eat, we know we ought not engage in, and yet we find ourselves tempted by these things. These happen. Happen to us, happen to Jesus. The next thing, the devil takes him, it took him to the, take him to the holy city and had, has him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so once we get through a physical temptation, we go to an ego temptation, a pride temptation. The devil says to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself off of here. Because it is written, the A will command his angels concerning you. They will lift up you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You are the Son of God. You can do all of these things. It's these ego and these pride temptations that often get us caught up even more than the physical temptations. It's the temptation of thinking, I am more important I am more essential. I am higher than the regulars. I am the elite. I am everything. And too often, this is a temptation that's very real for believers. is because we, we can think to ourselves, we can begin to get on our elitist high horse, and we can think, oh, look at us. We're here in church on Sunday morning. We're doing great. We're engaging in these things. We're in our Bible. We're praying. Aren't we the tops? Aren't we just the absolute best? Isn't the world just so grateful that we're here? 
And too often, that thought turns a corner into sometimes, sometimes it's just, you know, all these people out in the world, they just don't even know what we know. They just, they're not even like about what we're about. On Sundays, they go to brunch. They don't even go to church. They're at the Bob Evans at 10, 10 30. They don't even they don't have to deal, deal with the crowds. They don't have to deal with anything. They just they just don't. They just don't know. They just don't know. They just don't know what's going on. And it turns into this thought of we are so much better than them. And now we've got a problem. Because when I see myself as better than my neighbor, I am not loving them. I am judging them. When I see myself as superior to anybody else, I am not loving them, I am judging them. And not only that, I am wrongly seeing both them and myself. Because they are not as bad as I am making them out to be. And here's the part that's going to sting a little. I am not as good as I make myself out to be even on my best day. I have to remember that I am only through the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ not in the exact same boat. And that I didn't do anything to earn or deserve that. You know what's so weird? I mean, I read the New Testament all the time. I've read the Gospels over and over and over again. I'm not in there anywhere. I read the Gospels over and over and over again, and I keep looking for the part where I do something to earn my salvation, where I've done something to qualify myself for God's grace. I've done anything to help Jesus along, anything to pat him on the back, to say, hey, do you, for Jesus to look at me and go, man, you really earned this one, you deserve this one, it's just not in there. I keep reading it over and over and over again my whole life. I don't find myself in the New Testament anywhere. It turns out I didn't have anything to do with my salvation. I didn't have anything to do with the grace that God afforded me. All I did was receive it. All I did was stand here. And so the only thing that separates me from literally any of the other 7 billion people on earth, the, the ones who work with orphans in Calcutta and the ones that sit on death row, the only thing that separates me from any of those people is the salvation and grace that was freely offered to me by Jesus Christ, is freely offered to you by Jesus Christ, and is freely offered to each and every one of the seven billion people that inhabit this planet. Amen. And so we can't begin to think of ourselves wrongly, and we can't begin to think of others wrongly. And lastly, the third temptation is, uh, uh, the devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away, to, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And so the last temptation, not the last temptation of Christ, um, the last temptation that Jesus is going to experience here is simply the temptation of possession. It's, it's simply the temptation of stuff. Of wanting what's not yours, of wanting wasn't, what wasn't given to you. And the truth of the matter is, with this temptation, it doesn't matter what the offer, what the temptation is. It doesn't really matter. It could be anything. It could be the temptation to say, like it is with Jesus, I want, to, I want power. I want to rule over all of the kingdoms of the world. It could be the temptation of saying, man, if I could just have a little bit more. Just have a little bit more, a little bit more in that 401k, a little bit more in that savings account, a little bit more in the vacation account. If I could just put a Florida room on the back of the house, if I could just finish the basement, if I could just get that third car, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just, if I could just. And it turns out no matter how many steps we take forward, the finish line is always just a couple feet in front of our face. It could be the temptation I'm saying I'm dissatisfied with my spouse or with my partner. If I could just be married to such and such, if I could just, if I could just be married to that George Clooney, I don't know. 
If I could just be married to that Amal lady that George Clooney married, it's like, she's like a human rights lawyer slash supermodel. That's not real. But yet, there she is. Good for Amal. She's killing it. Um, if I could just have a different life, if I could just live in my neighbor's house, if I could just have different kids, if I could just... If I could just have a different family, if I could just work at a different job, I'm just, I'm just outside of where I want to be. And it's the temptation simply of dissatisfaction. Which is, I'm unhappy with what I have. I'm unhappy with where I am. And that's where Satan so often can play in the lives, especially in the lives of believers. Is because we, we look at ourselves and go, well, that's not sin. It's not sin to work hard. Right? It's not sin to want nice things. It's not, it's, not, it's not wrong. And in the lives of believers, we say, yeah, that's not wrong. But, but, but here's the thing. Anytime you begin to prioritize these sorts of things over God and what he's doing in your life, any of that can become sin. See, the idea is, here... We know, because we have the end of the story, that God and Jesus, there's gonna, they're going to rule over the whole world one day, over all the kingdoms. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. So it's not that God ruling over the world would be a bad thing. It would be a great thing. The question is, what would Jesus have had to give up to get it? What would Jesus have had to do to get it? And the question with our dissatisfaction, yours and mine, isn't necessarily that it would be wrong to put a Florida room on the back of the house. It would be nice. We call them Michigan rooms sometimes, you see them called, but that's okay. It'd be nice. It'd be nice to have a hot tub. You guys know how I feel about hot tubs. I love hot tubs, and I want to have a hot tub one day. And the question isn't, is it wrong for Paul to own a hot tub? I am grateful that, that the answer to that is no, it wouldn't be wrong. The real question is, what would I have to do to get it? Would I have to make it a priority in my life? Would I have to put it above God, above my family, above my relationships? Would I have to put anything in the place of God? So we've run through these temptations. We've talked about what it is that Jesus has been through in the wilderness. We've talked about why it is that Jesus has been through it in the wilderness. But we're left with one question. You see, we know that Jesus has gone through this temptation so there's nothing uncommon between him and mankind. So we have a God who relates. We have a Savior who knows our struggle. Who knows where we've been. The question is, what do we do? How do we respond? You know, the easy thing to do when you preach a message on Jesus' temptation as a wilderness is this, this is what, this, this is the really easy thing to do. So you know what Jesus did? He went back to Scripture over and over again. And that's how you defeat temptation, is through Scripture. And you know what? That's true. That is how you defeat temptation, is through Scripture. But, and there's always going to be a caveat there, it's not just through the yelling of Scripture over and over again. Jesus did not defeat the devil just because he said Scripture to him. That didn't work. It wasn't like you just say swipe or no swiping three times and it goes away. It's not, that's not how the devil works. Jesus didn't defeat the devil because he quoted scripture. Jesus defeated the devil because he lived scripture. Because he believed it. Because it was in his heart. Because it was in his spirit. Because it was who he was. Listen. I can stand up here and quote scripture all day. I can stand up here and quote the office all day. I can stand up here and quote Ferris Bueller's Day Off all day. I can say lots of things. I'm good at talking. As comes to a surprise of literally no one in this room. But, it, but what matters is what I believe. What matters is who I am. How I live. What matters isn't that Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What matters is that Jesus believes. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. What matters is that Jesus believes that man does not live by bread alone, but through every, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
And so the question for you and I, when we experience and encounter temptation, isn't going to be, well, what do you say? How, how do you respond? What words do you use? Do you have the right words? Do you have the secret password to defeat the devil? What matters isn't going to be what you say in that moment. What matters is going to be the scripture that you have hidden in your heart. What you have believed. What's inside. Listen, we're all going to go through difficult times and challenges. And temptation and these sorts of things are going to come at us in all sorts of different ways. It's not just going to look like, here, do you want this thing? Do something bad. It's not like this old school Veggie Tales version of temptation that says, if you want the thing, you're going to have to do the bad thing. Oh no, what should I do? It's going to come to you in the form of challenges and attacks. It's going to come to you in the form of people being unreasonable, unkind, and unmanageable when they deal with you. And the question is going to be, how are you going to respond to them? It's going to come in the form of difficult decisions and difficult choices where it doesn't seem like there's a right answer. It's going to come in the form of days when you say, I can't even get out of bed today. I can't even deal with anybody or anything today. And the question in those moments is going to be, what do you believe? What is God doing in your life? What is God doing in your heart? What has God built into your life? It's not about having the right words. It's not about always saying the right things. Thank God. I don't always have the right words. I frequently don't have the right words. I frequently don't say the right things. But I know that God is for me and not against me. I know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I know, like we read this morning, that my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. These may seem like small things. They may seem like things that we've heard and we've talked about and we've known all our lives. And yet, it is these small stones, these foundational blocks upon which we build our faith, upon which we build our life, upon which we build everything that we are as believers, as people. Everything that we are is built on those blocks, those steps. You may look at yourself and you may go, well, I don't know that much scripture. I don't know. I don't know that much about God's word. I don't know that much. Cool. Here's one for you. John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. There's a building block. There's one. So that when the devil comes against you and says, you're unworthy, you're unlovable, you've done nothing to deserve it, you've done nothing to earn it, why in the world would you ever have anything good happen to you? You can say, you know what? God loved the world. He gave his only son. That whoever believes can have eternal life. I believe that. I build my life on it. And suddenly... I can resist an attack of the enemy because I know how loved I am. I know the sacrifice that Christ made for me. And I know that if I believe, I can have eternal life. Boom. There's one. And you just build from there. You just get to know him. And now, it's not foolproof. It's not like if you read the Bible, but you're never going to have a bad day. It's not like you're never going to struggle. It's not like you're never going to have those difficult days. The question is just going to be how you respond to that. The question is going to be what it is that you do in response. Some days I struggle. I talk with you all about struggling with things like depression and anxiety and how those things can begin to just squeeze your mind. You can't think of anything except for where you're at and what you're doing. You can't even get out of bed in the morning. You can't stop thinking about that. And sometimes in those moments what I remember is that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Sometimes, I, I, sometimes I'll stand in the shower, I'll say to myself, 
God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a sound mind. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a sound mind. And I remind myself of those things. And you know what? It's not a miracle cure. It's not like I get out of the shower, do 10 car wheels, and win a Nobel Prize. You know what I do? I get out of the shower, and I go to work. And I work on a sermon. Or I check the voicemails. Or I do the email. And when you do those things, in the name of Christ, when you do those things because God's word is strong in you, when you do those things because God has given you the strength to do them, that's worship. That's holy. That's the call of God on your life. You don't have to be Mother Teresa every day. Some days, you got to check the voicemails. Some days, you got to put on a pair of shoes. Some days, you got to clean the cupboards. <coughs> and when you clean the cupboards because God has given you the strength to, it's worship. When you punch your time clock because God has given you the strength to, it's worship. When you get out of bed in the morning and take a shower, and that's all the strength you can find to do that day, that's worship if that strength came from God. So don't worry about comparing yourself to the person next to you. Don't worry about judging yourself or the person next to you. Don't think about whether you're strong enough. Spoiler alert, you're not, but God is in you. So you don't have to be strong enough. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to be smart enough. You don't have to be powerful enough. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have any of the answers. All you have to have is the salvation that you were given freely by the grace of God. Congratulations. <coughs> That was how Jesus defeated temptation. It was not by his own strength, not by his, his strength to resist, not by any of that, but simply by the word of God that lived inside of him and the strength that God had given him. And church, that's how we'll defeat temptation too. <laughs> not by any of our strength or ability or right words or right answers, but by the word of God that lives in us and the strength that God has given us. Would you bow your head to me? Father God, we're so grateful, Lord, God, I am so grateful this morning that I don't have to be anything other than what I am. God, I am so grateful this morning that I don't have to be super amazing. I don't have to have all the right answers. I don't have to have all the right words. I don't have to be strong. I don't have to be anything other than what I am. Because in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. On my worst day, you are made known in me. You're not mad at me. You're not angry with me. You're pleased with me, and that everything I do in your strength is worship. So God, today I want to worship you by relying on your strength. Today, God, I want to serve you by loving you well, and by loving the people that you put in my life. And today and every day, Lord, I just want to do what it is that you've said in front of me, not in my own strength, but in yours. Not in my own wisdom, but in yours. Not in my own ability, but in yours. We love you. Your name is Frank.